Hello and welcome to the module on modes of judicial process. Judicial process is a series of steps in the course of the administration of justice through the established systems of courts. This module will aim to explain and compare the different methods of judicial process. There are two main methods of judicial process which will form the basis of discussion in this module. First, the adversarial system and then the inquisitorial system. Before proceeding to understand these systems, First, look at the difference between common law countries and civil law countries. In common law countries, principles of law developed through cases are given a lot of importance. Thus, judges play a crucial role in shaping the law and several areas of law are not codified. Consistency in the law is maintained by the doctrine of judicial precedent, whereby decisions of a higher court are binding on lower courts. An example of a common law country is the United Kingdom, which, keeping with the common law tradition, functions without a written constitution. This can be contrasted with the functioning of civil law countries. In civil law countries, there is not much reliance on judicial precedent. Judges can decide independently of previous decisions and more focus and importance is given to statutory law, that is, law which is codified. Thus, in civil law countries, the law is highly codified through comprehensive, continuously updated legal codes. Examples of civil law countries are France, Germany and Greece. For now, having understood the difference between common law and civil law countries, we will proceed with the difference between the adversarial and the inquisitorial system. The difference between these two systems of judicial process can be understood according to seven points the burden of proof, the conduct of trial, investigation and discretion to prosecute, the role of the judge, admissibility of evidence, rights of the defendant and the role of the victim. For the rest of the module, we will be analysing each of these seven criteria as a basis for distinguishing between adversarial system and the inquisitorial system. Let us begin with the first ground of comparison, which is the burden of proof. In an adversarial system, the accused is innocent until proven guilty and it is the duty of the prosecution to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. The aim of the criminal justice system is thus to punish the guilty and protect the innocent. Hence, the burden of proof in an adversarial system is on the prosecution. In an inquisitorial system, the accused is presumed to be innocent. However, it is the duty of the judge to determine the truth. Thus, the standard of proof required is the inner satisfaction or conviction of the judge. I hope you have been able to understand the difference in burden between adversarial systems where the burden is on the prosecution and the aim is to punish the wrongdoer, whereas in inquisitorial systems, the aim is to find out the truth and hence the burden and the standard of proof required is the inner satisfaction of the judge trying the particular case. Having 
understood this first ground of difference, we can now proceed to the second ground of difference, which is the conduct of trial. In an adversarial system, the scope of the dispute is largely determined by the parties. They select the evidence that is presented before the court and the methods of examination and cross-examination are used to put information before the judge. Thus, the judge looks at that material which is presented to him by the advocates of either parties. In comparison to this, in an inquisitorial system, the role of the parties is restricted to suggesting the questions that may be put to the witness. It is the judge who puts the questions to the witness and there is no cross-examination as such. I hope now that you can understand the difference between the two systems based on the conduct of trial. Adversarial trials are similar to what occur in India, wherein the advocates of either party present issues and then present evidence before the court and the, co and the decision is taken based on the evidence that the parties put before the court. Contrast this with the conduct of trial in an inquisitorial system where it is not the parties but the judge who will determine what he wants to hear relating to a particular issue and it is the judge who asks questions to the witness based on the suggestions given by either parties. Having understood ground 2 for difference between adversarial and inquisitorial system, we will now proceed to the third ground of comparison which is made by considering who has the powers of investigation and the discretion to prosecute. In an adversarial model, responsibility for gathering evidence rests with the parties. During the trial, a neutral judge evaluates this evidence. Determining whether or not there is sufficient evidence to go to trial is a matter left to the discretion of the prosecutor. There is also an option for defendants to plead guilty and avoid trial. In contrast to this, in an inquisitorial model, the investigation is typically overseen by the judge of instruction. This judge can seek particular evidence, direct lines of inquiry favorable to either the prosecution or the defense, interview complainants, witnesses and suspects and ultimately determine whether there is sufficient evidence to take a case to trial. The judge of instruction then prepares a dossier and forwards it to the trial judge. Thus, the discretion of the prosecutor is limited and the defendant does not traditionally have the option to plead guilty. I hope you have understood this ground of difference with regard to the power of investigation and the discretion to prosecute. While in adversarial systems, this power is predominantly with the prosecutor who decides based on the evidence whether there is a sufficient ground to proceed with trial. In contrast, in an adversarial system, it is the judge of instruction who carries out the investigation. He prepares a report based on all the evidence that he has seen and forwards this to the trial judge who then decides whether or not a trial should take place, leaving much lesser discretion with the prosecution. Having understood this ground of difference, we will now proceed to the fourth ground of difference between the adversarial and inquisitorial system, which is with respect to the role of the judge. In an adversarial process, the judge is a neutral referee during the trial. 
It is the function of the judge to ensure that due process is observed. The judge must also decide whether the defendant is guilty beyond reasonable doubt and accordingly determine the sentence. The lawyer's role is to introduce evidence in favour of his party, cross-examine the opposite party's witness and present arguments in favour of his party. However, in an inquisitorial process, the judge acts as the principal interrogator of the witness and the defendant and is under an obligation to take evidence until the truth is ascertained. I think looking at this particular difference regarding the role of the judge would require us to go back to the first difference between adversarial systems and the inquisitorial system which is with regard to the aim of that particular system. Because in an adversarial system, the aim is to punish the wrongdoer, the judge has a role in the adversarial system to decide whether the standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt has been met. In contrast to this, the aim of the inquisitorial system being to find out the truth the judge is the person who has the power in an inquisitorial system to carry out the investigation, interrogate the witnesses and ultimately determine whether the evidence is sufficient to understand what the truth is. Having understood this ground of difference, we can now proceed to the fifth ground of difference which is with respect to the admissibility of evidence. In an adversarial system, evidence which is prejudicial or of little probative value is often likely to be withheld from juries as they are not well versed with the amount of importance that is to be given to such evidence. Hearsay evidence, which is a statement made by a person other than the witness, is usually admissible only if it is considered reliable. In contrast to this, in an inquisitorial system, the admissibility of evidence is dependent on the judge's evaluation of it being relevant. Thus, evidence is likely to be admitted regardless of its reliability or prejudicial nature as long as the judge deems it to be relevant. Let's take an example of hearsay evidence. Hearsay evidence, which is a statement made by a person other than a witness, will mo in most cases not be admissible in an adversarial trial because of the fact that it is not considered to be reliable to admit somebody else's account of a particular statement. However, in an inquisitorial system, hearsay evidence, which is considered unreliable in adversarial systems, would still be admitted in the inquisitorial system as long as the judge determines that listening to that particular hearsay statement is necessary for determining the truth. Having understood this ground of difference, we will now proceed to the sixth ground of difference which is with respect to the rights of the defendant. In an adversarial system, the accused enjoys the right to silence and cannot be compelled to reply. The trial is oral, continuous and confrontational. The parties use cross-examination of witnesses to undermine the opposing case and to discover information that the other side has not brought out. In both inquisitorial and adversarial systems, the accused is granted the right to a fair trial and is protected from self-incrimination. However, in an inquisitorial system, the defense has only a limited right of suggesting questions to the judge. It is left to the discretion of the judge whether to accept the suggestion or not. 
based on the rights given to a defendant it is possible to argue that the defendant has more rights in the adversarial system as opposed to the inquisitorial system having now understood the sixth ground of difference we will now proceed to the seventh ground of difference with this re with regard to the role of the victim in adversarial proceedings victims are not a party to the proceedings parties are only part it is the prosecutors who are appointed to act on behalf of the state and they do not specifically represent the victim in an inquisitorial system however victims have a more formal role in the pre-trial investigative stage including a recognized right to request particular lines of inquiry or to participate in interviews by the investigating authority some jurisdictions also allow the victim to be represented by a lawyer during the trial stage based on analysis of this particular difference it can be argued that a victim is more likely to get compensation in an inquisitorial system as opposed to an adversarial system simply because the victim has more opportunity to be involved in the inquisitorial system as opposed to the adversarial system where prosecutors act on behalf of the state this concludes the discussion on relation to the major differences between the adversarial system and the inquisitorial system having understood these differences we can now look at the system followed in india india follows a common law system the constitution of india incorporates the doctrine of binding precedent through article 141 which states that the decisions of the supreme courts are binding on all lower courts hence in consonance with common law tradition decisions of higher courts are binding on lower courts in india and a lot of importance is given to judge made law while india does follow the adversarial system there are several instances where the judicial process has incorporated inquisitorial elements it is interesting to analyze what these elements are and accordingly question whether these inquisitorial elements make india's adversarial system more just the first case that we will look at is maria margarida sequera fernandes versus erasmo jack de sequera the supreme court in this case held that truth should be a guiding star in the entire legal process thereby referring to the truth finding aim of an inquisitorial process similarly in ram chandra versus state of haryana the supreme court criticized the adoption of a purely adversarial approach by courts as it said that such an approach leads to an inevitable distortion due to a competition between opposing counsels an adoption of inquisitorial elements by the court would thus help reduce the reliance on advocates by the parties and thereby protect weaker sections before the court who are always at a disadvantage in terms of resources in fact this has been one of the major criticisms of the adversarial process where it is often said that the decision in an adversarial process depends not on the strength of the party's case but on the quality of a lawyer appointed by them which is why an incorporation of inquisitorial elements would help ensure that parties are not extremely disadvantaged simply because they cannot afford a very good lawyer 
Another area where inquisitorial elements have been incorporated in the Indian system is Article 32 of the Constitution, which provides the right to constitutional remedy. While dealing with matters under Article 32, the Supreme Court has stated on several occasions that it is not restricted by adversarial procedure, as in such procedures, a poor person is always at a disadvantage as compared to a rich person. When a poor person approaches the court under Article 32, it is often necessary for the court to devise a different procedure to secure protection of fundamental rights. Therefore, the power under Article 32 is not just limited to issuing writs. It is much wider and includes taking all such actions as are appropriate, even if this incorporates inquisitorial elements. This power of the case, this power of the court was analyzed in the case of Bandhua Mukti Morcha versus Union of India, where the Supreme Court appointed two persons as commissioners to make a report on the condition of the petitioners who were workmen. Contrast this to what we discussed about the role of the judge in an inquisitorial system, where in the inquisitorial system, the judge does have a right to conduct an invest investigation. This is somewhat similar to what the Supreme Court did in the Bandwa Mukti Morcha case by appointing commissioners to conduct an investigation on the, on the position of the petitioners. The respondents in the Bandwa Mukti Morcha case argued that the report of the commissioners could not have evidentiary value as it was based on ex parte evidence that had not been subject to cross-examination. In a typically adversarial environment, such an argument would have made sense because an adversarial system does not permit the judge to conduct an investigation and always provides a right to cross-examination for the defendant. However, interestingly, the court rejected this argument of the respondent and held that the appointment of commissioners and the reliance on the report submitted by them was within the powers of the Supreme Court under Article 32. This establishes that there are inquisitorial elements within Article 32 which are aimed at ensuring that poor and disadvantaged litigants are not subject to critis are not subject to the problems with the adversarial system. The adoption of inquisitorial elements is more pronounced in the criminal justice system, while in an adversarial process the judges should remain neutral. There are points where the judge assists the case towards justice, thereby introducing inquisitorial elements. In state of Rajasthan versus Ani alias Hanif, the Supreme Court confirmed that in criminal trials, the judge has to play an assessing role and is not merely a neutral third party. Further, in the case of Mohan Lal versus Union of India, the Supreme Court observed that such an assessing role is required to bring the best available evidence to the notice of the court and avoid issues of prosecutorial misconduct. Thus, in these cases, we see how the Supreme Court has said that it cannot be merely a neutral third party spectator and that it would have to intervene and direct a case towards justice as and when the need arises. Other similar criminal provisions also point towards incorporation of inquisitorial elements. For instance, the charge against an accused 
is framed by the judge and not the prosecution. Thus, the judge has the role of refining the prosecution's findings and determining the existence of a prima facie case. These powers are given to the judge and magistrate under sections 228 and 240 of the Code of Criminal Procedure respectively. Section 165 of the Indian Evidence Act also incorporates inquisitorial elements by enabling the court to ask a witness any questions in any form at any time and in order and to order the production of a document or a thing. The judge also has the power to examine any person as a witness even if he has not been called by the parties under Section 311 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Further, under Section 313 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, the judge can examine the accused at any time to get an explanation. The prosecutor, too, has to take permission of the court before withdrawing a case under Section 321 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. These provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure direct us to the understanding that at several points during a criminal trial, such as examination of witnesses, production of documents, or withdrawal of a case by the prosecution, the court actually follows a slightly inquisitorial pattern in what is otherwise an adversarial system in order to ensure better protection of the rights of both parties. Another example of an inquisitorial system can be seen in the residuary powers of the High Court under Section 482 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. This power states that nothing in the court, nothing in the code shall be deemed to limit or affect the inherent powers of the High Court to make such orders as may be necessary to give effect to any order under the court or to prevent the abuse of process of any court order or to otherwise secure the ends of justice. A similar power is given to civil courts under Section 151 of the, civil, of the Code of Civil Procedure. We thus see that the inherent powers of the court allow it to introduce inquisitorial elements which would not otherwise be present in an adversarial system if such elements are required to fulfill the ends of justice. The Justice Malimat Committee report on reforms of the criminal justice system discussed the merits and demerits of adopting an ad inquisitorial process in India. The committee noted that the benefits of an adversarial system in criminal trials is that the rights of the accused are better protected, ensuring a fairer trial. However, the committee felt that certain inquisitorial elements should be included in the judicial process to make it more effective. It seems that presently India's judicial system is in line with what the Justice Malimat Committee report suggested, wherein it is predominantly adversarial, but at several points there are inquisitorial elements that have been incorporated to better protect the rights of the parties. Throughout the module, it is important to understand that while understanding the differences between common law and civil law countries, and the differences between the adversarial and inquisitorial system. The comparison has been made on a general and conceptual level so that it's easy to understand what the difference is rather than focus on specific procedural aspects. Therefore, while continuing further studies on this subject, it is advised that 
you go into that while different countries may adopt slightly different procedures the essential difference between adversarial and inquisitorial systems would be as is outlined in this module this concludes the module on modes of judicial process i hope you have understood the differences between these two processes and then can go on to analyze what sort of process india follows and probably even suggest how india could make its judicial process more effective by incorporating either more adversarial or inquisitorial elements make sure you solve the self check exercises provided at the end of the module this will help you test your understanding of the module and also direct you towards further reading in this area thank you for listening